Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palenker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. If our show were part of the 90s late night TV lineup, we'd be the show that comes on after the show that comes on after Dave. So it would go Dave, Ted Koppel, Test Pattern, you would drift off and then be jerked awake by us. But today's show may actually get your semi-conscious attention because we are welcoming two of Dave's prize-winning writers, both Steves, which is the name they were issuing to mid-century funny babies. We have Steve O'Donnell and Steve Young, or as they were referred to on their season of The Bachelorette, Steve O and Steve Y. But first, Fritz, what are you recommending? Of- I'm, I want to talk about Anatomy of a Scandal. This is a new series that just dropped last week on Netflix. It's five episodes long. It's a British production, but it's co-produced and co-written by David E. Kelly, who I love, and he knows how to spin a yarn. It, it's it's a British production. It's about a parliamentary minister, James Whitehouse, who's a happily married man, he thought, they thought, with a loving family, he thought, they thought, a wife, two kids. But then a scandalous secret comes to life. It's based on a book by Sarah Vaughan. It's not a true story, but it's based on Vaughan's experiences covering British sex scandals as a courtroom reporter. It's about parliamentary intrigue. It's about the British court system. It's about wig-wearing solicitors. It's about the Me Too topics of the current day. The story probes, and it's interesting, the nature of consent as in sexual consent. That is, if a couple has an ongoing sexual relationship and at one single moment they have sex that's a little rougher than their usual and not invited by the female partner, can it be considered rape? It's pretty interesting. They get very real about sex in an elevator and they do some semi-biological play-by-play, but because all the dialogue is in a British accent, it doesn't seem shocking. It seems more like an episode of Nova. The leads are Sienna Miller as Sophie Whitehouse and Rupert Friend as James Whitehouse. It is definitely a conversation starter between couples. I liked it. I thought it was great. Well, I'm midway through it, so I I recommend it. It's very intriguing in in a dark sort of sinister way i mean you don't know who to root for because everyone they keep they kind of keep flashing back to college days where more raucous behavior was perhaps not me too in a way that it that it currently is and so we looked at things go differently. ahead steve yes yeah, steve. I, I have to go answer my go, oh, go, that's go do it steve's Oh, look, he has. Uh, maybe I can take this uh, opportunity to introduce myself. I am the Steve in the room, so we'll call my we'll call me Room Steve. The other Steve, well, you can call Zoom Steve, right? Perfect. Since he's uh, in New York and he's going to pick up a UPS package, which is the kind of thing that you know happens when you do a, a live show or live to tape. I guess. Do you think that he'll be willing machine. to unbox live for us? Oh, what if it's something tedious like tax forms or estimated tax coupons or? Well, it He's also retired, could be. So it's probably the best part of his day. So <laughs> let's not take the joy away from him. I will say that Zoom Steve has a lot of eccentric hobbies mm-hmm. that we, we might get into eventually. So who knows? It could be anything. Do you want to take bets on what he would have ordered? Um, maybe it's an old uh, brownie camera from 1929 <laughs> that has some uh, undeveloped uh, but exposed film in it that he'll take to a dark room and develop. Or a recording develop. Of, of, of a musical about um, pistons. Yes, <laughs> or uh, or uh, perhaps uh, silicate gels or some <laughs> such thing. Yes, yeah, Steve. I mean, well, I now we can't wait to find out. An original anyway. cast album. All right, so I'm going to talk about something that he's really not going to enjoy returning to his camera to hear me saying. But I have not exactly enjoyed, but I have been enlightened by Jimmy Savile, A British Horror Story on Netflix. So both of our picks are very British and very Netflix this week. Jimmy Savile was for decades a beloved UK TV personality. Shortly after his death in 2011, an investigation prompted more than 450 horrific allegations of sexual assault and abuse of children with victims as young as five. You may not have heard of Jimmy Savile in the States, but for the Brits, this was like discovering that Santa Claus, Dick Clark, and Mother Teresa are child molesters. It's a punch. 
Jimmy Savile hosted Top of the Pops. He DJed on Radio One and helmed a Saturday kids show called Jim Will Fix It, where he made dreams come true for children. He was on stage at concerts introducing the Beatles or the Stones. He was besties with Prince Charles and Margaret Thatcher. His eccentric persona, complete with wild patterned outfits, a giant cigar, and a bleached Prince Valiant haircut, presented him as a man apart. He defies definition and is thereby beyond judgment. This is how he groomed an entire nation. The vast expanse and volume of his charity work not only solidified his placement above reproach, it also gained him access to children, sick children, paralyzed children. He did not just raise money for hospitals, he lived in them and had the run of them, volunteering, shuttling kids in and out of rooms, showcasing his selfless acts with cameras present while violating kids around every private corner. Why was he not stopped and prosecuted within his lifetime? The UK and the BBC will need to answer that. But there were a lot of important and powerful people who benefited from this story remaining caught and killed. Like Bill Cosby, Michael Jackson, Harvey Weinstein, Woody Allen, he was too big to fail. You will find Jimmy Savile, A British Horror Story on Netflix. And Fritz, you watch this. Yeah, it was just very haunting. But it was a great study of the culture of personality and sort of a really extreme example of what we just experienced in this country for five years and and how uh, fame is its own cachet. I mean, Prince Charles was writing this guy letters asking him for public relations advice on how for how the royal family should conduct themselves. I mean, there was every door in British Government was open to him. It was creepy. But the creepiest thing about this was, and you can see the picture of him, he looks like Woody Allen in a wig, which creeped me out from the minute I started watching. Yes, I would think that uh, you'd be suspicious of his grooming an entire nation just based on the way he groomed his own <laughs> Morlock-like hair. Morlock-like hair. <laughs> yes. Exactly. There's like different, definitely various incarnations of this hairdo as he, as he proceeds through the years. But it, each one is more disturbing than the last. Okay. We have live in the studio, returning from his front door, a Steve Young, rich with package. Yes, uh, I, I have a, a package which I now have back upstairs with me. Uh, we, if you if you want to have a big reveal at the end of the show, we could uh, we could see what I got. It could actually be slightly fun to look at for thirty seconds. Definitely. Now there's a man who understands the hour clock of television, mm -hmm. the big tease. So I'm going to introduce our, our guests, Fritz. Would that be I good? I can't wait to talk to both of them. The brilliantly amusing Steve O'Donnell worked on Letterman nearly since the show's inception. Steve served as head writer from 1983 through 1992. The iconic top 10 list was curated under Steve's masterful guidance. It was a groupthink type of genius, but I like to credit mostly Steve because he's the guy Dave needed to write the books interjecting. Well, I'm just saying, yes, I did put the books together yeah. and I did write the introductions, but there are half a dozen people that uh, it's it's a uh, little like the, the the beneficiaries in Howard Hughes as well. There's a lot of uh, <laughs> contesting um, individuals who uh, come forward and they all deserve credit. Um, Can I finish your bio though? Uh, I mean, yes. that's really nice, but I was reading. During Letterman's final season, Steve wrote and spoke about his time as head writer on the show and completed his own list of the show's top 10 moments for the New York Times. Steve went on to work as the head writer for Jimmy Kimmel Live from the show's debut in 2003 until 2008. He occasionally appeared in bits as well. Steve has worked as a head writer and producer on The Bonnie Hunt Show, The Dana Carvey Show, Norm MacDonald Live, Why with Hannibal Burris on Comedy Central, and Norm MacDonald has a show for Netflix. He has appeared in on-screen roles in Strangers with Candy and the Sarah Silverman program. Steve has won four Emmys and the Writers Guild of America Herb Sargent Award for Comedy Excellence. And he has appeared on each of my various and sundry podcasts. Welcome, Steve. <laughs> Thank you. And then here comes the equally impressive bio of young Steve Young. For 25 years, Steve Young wrote for Letterman on both Late Night and The Late Show. He's also written for The Simpsons, and he wrote the Emmy-nominated, Matt Groening-produced animated Christmas special, Olive, the other reindeer. Steve's most recent credits include <laughs> Lauren Michaels, Maya and Marty, an NBC variety show, Harry Connick Jr. show Harry, and HBO's Night of Too Many Stars. A Harvard graduate, Steve is brilliantly profiled in Deva Wisenat's award-winning comedy music documentary, Bathtubs Over Broadway, now on Netflix. Welcome, Steve's. Do you two remember your first encounter? Oh, it, probably at my twin brother's apartment. That's memorable, right? Didn't, weren't you staying with uh, Mark O'Donnell for a week or two when you first got to New York City? 
Yes, uh, fall of 1989. That's probably the first time we met in person, although I do remember uh, calling you at the late night program in the late 80s. And it's miraculous to me that you had the time to a- answer a phone call from a stranger. <laughs> but I was like about to graduate from college and wanted to be a comedy writer. Oh, I, wanna, I know what I'll do. I'll call the head writer at the Letterman Show. <laughs> He's got nothing better to do than chat with me in the mid afternoon on a weekday. Somehow he chatted amiably with for a few minutes with me and made me feel like uh, at least I who knows what would happen to me. But at least. There were friendly people in the business. So that was well, what is it about Harvard University? You two guys, um, Colin Jost and uh, Conan O'Brien. What is, is it the lampoon work or I mean, some of the most brilliant guys coming out of Harvard and and women, we should assert. Um, I, I, I think it's a paradox. I, I think it actually doesn't make any sense because Harvard is <laughs> is, is pretty straight laced and pretty uh, earnest, and maybe that's why it is such a, an oasis of uh, zaniness for those undergraduates who have an impulse to to work on a, a magazine and cut the cartoon and to be part of a publication. Did you all do the lampoon? Uh, yes, uh, both of us did. We were that lucky, that fortunate, and it it. it, it you hear it as the as the graduates get older and older. They all say, "Oh, but it wasn't a an automatic springboard into show business the way it sort of is now." Um, the a year or two before me, there was a, a a fantastic writer who remains a giant and a legend named Jim Downey, who graduated from the Lampoon and went to work for Saturday Night Live, and that was the sort of first connection of that sort. There had been a couple of graduates who had put together the National Lampoon, uh, Henry Beard and Doug Kenny. And I remember seeing that in high school and just going, wow, they know what they're doing. They're doing it right. And that only happens every couple of years where you see something that's like Key and Peel or Second City TV and you just go, wow, they really know what they're doing. It's perfect. Um, so there was a little bit of a, a lampoon aura about it already. Uh, Steve, by the time you were there, you overlapped a bit with uh, who were some of your peers uh, in the 90s or late 80s? Yeah, uh, Conan O'Brien was the president when I got on the staff. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were plenty of other funny people around that really made me think, oh, maybe this is a thing I should do with my life. I think it was the case that uh, Harvard had this well-established humor magazine. I don't think we had funnier uh, students necessarily than any other decent college, but there was just this momentum of here's this thing right in front of you that is showing you, you could work on this and then look at all these graduates who've gone on to things like the Letterman show or Saturday night live. That was kind of my uh, awakening that, Oh, that's a career. I had no idea. And I can only (laughs) imagine there are, many similar types of men and women at that young age who don't get that uh, sort of prompt from where they happen to be going to college. Right. So it awakens the possible. Yes. And we should acknowledge that, it, of course, it is a boon and a help and a leg up to have done it. But it is not always a plus. It's a plus and a minus. I've been on shows where they go, no, no more Lampoon people uh, because it's just too many West Pointers in your platoon, yeah. you know. <laughs> and Conan O'Brien himself, I don't know if the word suffered is exactly the right verb, but he applied for a job on The Letterman Show. And it was between him and a pretty funny writer from – um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, named Boyd Hale, and I was going over it with Dave. Well, uh, who, who do we like? And he said, "We got enough enough with the Lampoon people. Let's go with the 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 Oki." So yeah. uh, we passed by we passed by Conan O'Brien, but he went to Saturday Night Live, and uh, I I don't know what happened to him after that. I, I think he, he ended up in banking or something. But yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's okay. He landed on his feet. I have definitely heard that it's loud. Now, the shorthand for what we don't want any more of. Oh, we don't need any more of those Harvard Lampoon type people. No, that's the cliche now of what uh, we already have too much of. So so it can be good and bad. These things go in waves. I don't think the public would perceive that, though, would they? That was just an inside 
baseball. Uh, uh, who uh, the public? Um, who would they know? They'd know yeah. Colin Jost. They'd know yeah. some of the SNL people. But whether they even feel there's a, a Harvard, like the really early uh, public figures who were who were Harvard Lampoon grads, did have sort of a Harvard character to them, like Fred Gwynn, who was Herman <laughs> Munster. He did sort of bear himself like a <laughs> Harvard man, you know. And that get locked jaw. Yeah, and. Um, also, uh, uh, your paper lion, help me, George Plimpton. He, uh -huh. he definitely had the, the Harvard accent. Um, but, <laughs> of course, that's not funny. It's, it's like they have to be Thurston Howell to be funny and have a, and have a Harvard accent. <laughs> there are those who scoff at coastal elites, elites, and so things go in waves. And, of course, you guys are really smart and really excellent at what you do. But, but, but everyone is waiting for a bucket of paint to fall out either of our heads really that but would be the i will perfect. say by the time you showed up in the early 70s and then me in the mid 80s there was a preponderance of harvard students who had gone to public schools and were even on financial aid and i know you and i are both from families with the solid good middle class blue collar backgrounds right so we are not from a long line of legendary lawyers and uh blue bloods legacy children yes i try to dispel the uh, disdain and contempt early on by going i was a scholarship student i'm the ninth of ten brothers and sisters my dad's a welder your dad uh, was an airplane mechanic for decades and decades i think that was one thing we could bond over i think er an early conversation uh, between us was do you own any steel-toed shoes and we both <laughs> did we both had at least one pair yeah so how much overlap was there how many years did you guys work together on the show Two or three. Uh, you hired me in April of 1990. All right. So, so, so well, I was still around for. A few, I was head writer till 93, and then uh, and then uh, lingered in some capacity for another year or two, and then came and went for different special projects. And that's been true up until this past month or so. Um, and then, but happened? we, but we have kept a friendship up right along. Let me ask you a question about the hiring. How, how involved is Dave in the hiring? Does he trust you and like, tell me later who you hired, or is he involved in the selection process? I'd say he's involved. He always reads packages, you know. It's uh, uh, and occasionally he'd be moved by uh, a stand-up's performance. You he know, read he my package he, and said, "Nope." Well, that's not exactly what happened. I mean, he it yeah. might have ultimately not been yes. No, the I exciting never... news, Steve, was that he had taken home my package and then nothing. So. I well, think it was a hard pass. A Hollywood no. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a writer, it was always like no one ever really. It's just we're not picking up your option. That's usually how how it but goes. As I recall, Steve, you probably had read my uh, submission in early 1990 when there was some turnover on the staff, and I do recall being invited by you to come up to. Uh, tour around the office with you and maybe say hello to Dave. So clearly there was a, a layer of it of he looks good on paper, but let's just make sure he's not going to creep everybody. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> there is an element of that. Yes, the hygiene check and the. Uh, but what, what's included in your package, if you'll excuse the expression? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what did you submit? Like uh, 15 pages of jokes or I mean, what was the package? I think at that point I had had various uh, bits of material that had been used. I worked on not necessarily the news for a oh. little bit. I had a couple good pieces out of that. I sent the scripts for. I think I'd written some pieces for National Lampoon that had gotten published, but I probably also did some just miscellaneous ideas specifically for the Letterman show and maybe some top tens. I know in later years it was a very specific uh, here's a list of things to work on if you want to make a submission. Here's a top ten topics. Oh. Yeah, it got, very, it got to be very. It got to be very fill in the blanks kind of application process. But uh, up through my head writership, it was just uh, catch as catch can. What uh, of course people would send in their novels and their short stories, and <laughs> you'd go like, well, this doesn't really help me. <laughs> uh, my own submission to Merrill Marco, the original head writer, Berkeley grad. Um, 
included drawings and um, sort of schematic things to show how things would look. And she was, I think she liked that because you understand that there was a visual element to television. But what I recall about your submission, Steve, is that the, the type of odd, slightly goofy, surreal lines that you were putting were so short and clean, I knew they would appeal to Dave. I mean, a classic Steve Young line, if I may quote you and probably misquote you, is that, you know, we have... Uh, NyQuil for you, your, when you have your sore throats and uh, colds at nighttime, and we have DayQuil, you know, but what, what for daytime, but what do you do when there's an eclipse? And then Dave <laughs> would show Eclipse Quill for that medicine you take. And uh, just n not, not something you'd compare to anyone else. And so that well, was a nice thing. So, Steve O'Donnell, in your New York Times piece, you refer to running bits like the top 10 list as repeatables. Talk about their importance in creating a daily program and remind us of some other memorable repeatables and their respective lifespans. Uh, well, some went on forever, viewer mail. You're doing a show every night. You, if, you were, if you were doing it, cutting each one from whole cloth... Uh, it would be almost impossible. Even when you're a kid, you, you, the comic books you read and the magazines you read, you know there's these different departments and things that reappear. The back page is like this. The center spread is like this. Um, uh, they did viewer mail in the first week or two of the show, and I think they continued to do it right up and through the, through the end. But anything you can – the top ten certainly – and there were many times Dave was very close to like, we got to retire this. We're, this is – we got to be ahead of the crowds on this. We can't keep doing – but it always came back by popular demand. And also it was not – Effort went into it, but it was not taxing from a production perspective. All you needed was a Chiron machine. <laughs> by the way, by the end of my my, uh, my Letterman career, all my sisters and brothers were like, "Oh, is that the Chiron that we're looking at now?" Or is, <laughs> or is that? Are you, or they sort of got uh, all this. Chiron puts the they got the, the lexicon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, is that the Dubatine there in the <laughs> cyclorama? <laughs> you so learned how to talk the, up with the, your siblings. Talk about the advent of the top ten list and what what made you feel like this would be a, a brilliant idea. I, I think I have the story right about. It, it. There's no disputing that it was this single uh, uh, afternoon where uh, the New York Daily News or perhaps Newsday had a list of top ten eligible bachelors and included William Paley, who at that point was 89. I had worked at the Museum of Broadcasting and was familiar with Paley, so I was going around showing the list, going, "Isn't this ridiculous?" And uh, many people at the, uh, simultaneously were going, "Let's do our own. We should do our own." My thought was, "It takes nothing to do these. They, they have absolutely no credentials or validity." so anyone could do them. The spirit of them, the style of the best of them was based on a, 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 a kind of, not a top 10 list, but a, a kind of list they used to do on the new show that Jim Downey was behind, the aforementioned genius who towers like a colossus above all uh, um, recent comedy. And um, uh, Randy Cohen recommended it. Uh, 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 Kevin Curran recommended it. He actually wrote the very first top ten list, which was top ten words that almost rhyme with peas. <laughs> and Nerd. yes, and um, I, I think the I think the image to use is that we were so desperate for things to do over and over and over again that uh, this seeing this top ten list, it, what followed subsequently was like a bunch of people on a desert island. A crate full of food washes on shore. Whose idea is it to eat the food? You know? <laughs> so uh, I think it has many fathers, like the Internet. How did the writing assignment go? Did one person write the top ten? Sometimes, day? sometimes, yes. Uh, uh, but but uh, as the show went on and on, it got to be more of a grab bag. Everybody would write a couple. Um, the head writer would pitch the 30 or 40 best ones by their lights. Dave would sometimes kick in a couple. And certainly during the writer strikes, Dave would write them completely by himself. And it was funny because we uh, like to keep it to two panels, another term. For, um, but when Letterman would write them, they would sometimes be three and four panels. So he allowed himself more verbiosity uh, than he sometimes would. But that makes sense. He knew, he knew what he was willing to say. Um, I have a question, if I may ask. Uh, did Bill Paley ever find somebody nice? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think he had to find solace with his uh, with his Picassos and his uh, Dom Perignon cellar. Oh, well, that sounds like a gilded nightmare. But I have to say that in later years, we kept doing the top ten right up to the end in 2015, 
And some days it went together easily, some days not. Uh, more and more it was based on things in the news, just current events yes. topics. Some of our favorites were the weird ones. I always remember, I think this was during your tenure, Steve, top 10 Keebler Elf euphemisms for death. <laughs> that is already, it's a home run. On the, cooling rack. <laughs> On the cooling rack. On the cooling rack. Well, thing. yes, I, I agree with you because, again, the first one, words that almost rhyme with peas, was just absurd. And the other ones that were always close to my heart were like the ways the world would be different if it was run by dogs. Uh, things like that. So the ones that were just like Dan Quayle or Donald Trump, it was just like, okay, yeah, we sort of know what's going to be coming here. The, um, the ones I really loved were the special ones, like the Mother's and Father's Day ones, when you would get the Mothers of Stars <laughs> to come out and each do their oh, own yeah. one, or the Fathers, because they were just uncomfortable enough to make this stuff even funnier, and I love those. Yes, I think that uh, that's a... a, a, a a pillar of the Letterman Show appeal was having people who weren't quite uh, broadcast professionals <laughs> delivering uh, lines in front of a camera, whether they were stagehands or whether they were a secretary of state. Uh, they, they weren't necessarily adept uh, or, or agile in front of a camera. Um, yeah. Well, um, here's awkward timing. Thomas, could you bring up the list of the memorable, top 10 memorable moments? It's under, let's see. Steve's list of, where did I put that? The so New Tom, York Times one? Yeah, New York Times. Because I want to see if Steve Young has any dissenting opinions about well, the I'm going to be like Mr. Letterman and cross off six of them at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, this when when you, it was truly a Yankee dollar when you got a, a, a approval from Letterman, uh, something solid, because the, the vast majority of things would be like, no, 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 no. Uh, the, the worst thing would be, Lord, no, Lord, Ooh, no. And yeah. But then you would sometimes get a, hmm, I don't mind that. I don't mind that too much. Yeah. And that would yeah. be like, that would be like angels coming through the clouds. What were the third rails light. with Dave? What, what, what could you, what areas of life could you avoid and be safe? <laughs> well, I will tell one, I'll, I'll give you one specific only because it also happens to illuminate the character of Jimmy Kimmel. When I went to the Kimmel show, um, ABC had like a mini series about Hitler, where there was a fictional biography. It was called Hitler, the mini series. And um, I proposed Mini Hitler, the series, where we'd have a little person playing Hitler who's always Heil, Heil Hitlering into their groin and sophisticated jokes like that. And, and Kimmel was amused. And I said, you know, Letterman wouldn't even, I, I couldn't even pitch a, uh, uh, anything involving little people or midgets because. Letterman used to tell me, uh, Stephen, unlike most comedy writers, I don't automatically find something funny because a midget is involved. And uh, Kimmel just said, <laughs> that's where Dave and I are different. <laughs> he wasn't entirely serious. And of course, uh, the not using the little person word was just the, uh, the uh, authentic jargon of the time. But anyway, Kimmel had a sense of humor about his own tastes and so on. And no bigger Letterman fan in the entire world. No, I know that. He openly admits that. Does it sting to have Dave kind of crossing things off publicly? Not really. I mean, uh, uh, your job is to give him what he wants, and you want him to be happy out there. Uh, also, you... you this is why it, it, you want him in on the choosing the writers as well, because you, they've got a. You, you want to feel a simpatico with his voice. It's a tricky thing. You want you want different voices, but they also have to harmonize or at least uh, make a chord. Yeah, yeah. What so, was the? Uh, just let me ask one more question because oh, okay. I want to get to your thing. I'm so interested. In it, but while we're on this topic, what was the percentage of accepted jokes presented to Dave compared to the total number of jokes you would present to him on a daily basis? Oh, it, I mean more rejected than accepted, but I think it varied from day to day. Occasionally, where there were writers involved who were just so good, like Tom Gamble and Max Pross, who did the, they took my show away, he probably went with 98% of it if he changed anything at all. But I think most things, he, some things he liked better than others. It depended on mood and everything, but his taste was good and he knew what he wanted. And mm -hmm. how do you argue with that? And mm -hmm. that's, I think that is one of the definitions of success is a person who has a very clean view of where they want to go in the world and can make, you know, kind of quick on their feet m moves and decisions that are, 
usually correct or usually wise. Yes, and th- those areas that aren't crystal clear, there's at least an instinctual feeling. Right, yes. We, even the writers would go, we know Dave's not going to put on a funny hat and we know he's not going to do this and that. But eventually he would do things like... But he liked... To, okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, I, for years, people would pitch Dave Talks with Kids and, you know, he'd say, what am I, Art Link letter? No. But then eventually he tried it once and it went so well that, Maybe after that he, he could had be persuaded. I, and I only say that because he was he was um, he was um, amenable, open to he he there he could try things and be persuaded. But I mean, again, this is a very smart, very funny guy. This isn't like a a, a, a blank slate that you have to pour things on. He was he's fine on his own. To be a writer is to be you're a privilege to be a partner in the whole proceedings. And very unlike our. Linkletter because he had just enough snark where he was like the W.C. Fields character lording over this kid, <laughs> but he but he never made the kid uncomfortable. But he was so darn funny. Well, yes. What was interesting it, it, about that was that kids got him. Like kids got it immediately. They they understood the tone and they reacted in in kind. Yeah. Well, it, it would become conceptually complicated because he would sometimes use an old Art Link letter device like, are you married? Yeah. <laughs> and a kid would be very, they'd be struck because it was like, you're showing me this respect as if you think I'm an adult. But I, um, but there were other things that he had tried. I think Kimmel uh, has, has done amazingly well with kids, even though he he tiptoes very closely to the cruel, you know, like when they take away the Halloween candy or pretend to. And then the kid, it, you'll have to see them. Look them up online. There, there, there's, there's a moment of, of you're appalled and you're, you're sickened, uh, but then you come around and, and laugh. And a, a, a shock and a gasp that then leads to laughter is sometimes the best. That the they're... best, the best. It's like, is it okay to laugh? And then once you do, you explode. So this is an article. You can set this up, Steve, and who asked you to do it and uh, upon the occasion. Are you commenting who asked you to do it? No, like, no, I'm wondering that's how like you were. my folks. Who asked you? How was this work commissioned, young sir? Um, a, a New York Times editor. I think I had written a few things for them uh, spottily in the before that. Your, vo- your voice works quite nicely in print. It's very fun to read. So this was so you put together a top ten list of moments, and I, I'm not exactly sure how you curated or you know what you used to do your research to prepare this. this. But none whatsoever, entirely based on my my memory and my gut feelings. Right. I did know that this was not unique at the time. There were a dozen other people proffering their and inevitably top 10 because it was connected with the show, their favorite moments. I went with some genuinely favorite moments, but I tried to think of some things that were not going to be on everyone's list. Okay. My number one, for example, and maybe you're getting to this, I don't know, it was it seemed very small. It was this, this annual thing we would do just to, to kill time, but also to be joyously silly, it was every time it was like the, the first day of spring or the first warm day in New York City, we would ceremonially welcome the warm weather by going into the control room and see Hal Gurney, our director, unbutton his second time. <laughs> button from the top of his shirt and funny the first time but after you've been doing it for years and years it starts to get sublime you know what are some of the other uh events or episodes that make your list just rattle off a few uh, if you would Steve. Uh, well i can't read them from here this oh. is uh, this is sort of like but i can remember them believe okay. it or not uh and i've been happy that many of them have been um have been posted on the, 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 the fairly new Letterman YouTube channel. I mean, you can find many of these under the auspices of the, uh, the avid collector and poster Don Giller, and I believe he's consulting on this new YouTube channel that is exclusively. So, yeah, but some of the things on the list, for example, were you know things that we all remember, anyone who watched Letterman remember, which was you know Warren Zevon's uh, appearance with Dave, the, Dave's uh, being the first talk, talk show to come back yes. on the air after 9-11. I tried to balance uh, uh, some some more serious things with the mm-hmm. silly things. Uh, I think that was pivotal, Steve. That night showed a, a three-dimensional side to Letterman that people didn't even know existed. His empathy, his humanity, his, you know, um, embracing what we had been through. He That was really an amazing night. I'll never forget that. Yes, and, and it's... It, Having watched it a few times, he doesn't really condemn anyone or 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 get angry. It's more uh, uh, more just identifying with all his all his viewers about how 
how tragic and sad it is and that we must go on. So, um, yeah, without really grinding an axe, it was an accomplishment. But, again, there were silly things, uh, uh, things that were on uh, – things that have been posted since on the, the new YouTube channel is uh, Larry Bud Melman at the Port Authority not using the microphone properly. When he's talking, <laughs> he's putting it in the mouth of the, the interviewee. And when they're talking, he's got it in front of his own mouth. For some reason – in that time and place, it was just perfect. I just loved him. How did he come to your attention? How was he cast? Th this was uh, this was two writers from the first years of the show named Steve Weiner and Carl Tiedemann, who were had been NYU students, and they'd made a student film that included Melman as a character. It was a perfect premise. It was, it was supposed to be a, a, a documentary about the the cheapest movie studio that ever existed. So they got to do twenty five short parodies of really bad movies and uh, the actor Calvert DeForest uh, played the the head of the studio and they included it in their submissions to the Letterman show so uh, Dave Letterman and Meryl Marco were intrigued by um, by the actor and so they they hired both the writers uh, and who who did a lot of funny other kinds of stuff over the uh, years uh, but they kept but they kept the moment around too and by the way I, I I have been saying this for years, and I think it's true, but someone else will have to verify it. Calvert DeForest, um, he wasn't really playing a character. It, it, it exactly conformed to his actual personality. And he was from an acting family on both sides, the DeForests and the Calverts, in some weird way connected to, you know, the Barrymores and so on. It was So that's partly why he half pursued it. But he was working as a clerk in a methadone clinic when he was hired. Um, well, we, we sort of... Uh, uh, piecemeal used him for the first two or three years of the show. And then when they found out he was making so much money doing NBC television that they had to let him go from the sort of government uh, uh, supported methadone clinic. But so we hired him full time and it was well worth it. He may have been a distraction at that location because he was pretty much a household face. <laughs> so now, did he care or know whether or not he was being laughed at or laughed with? Uh, it's a wonderful question, but I think it was... It wasn't exactly laughing at. I, I do think he was just a just a wonderful, bizarre element of like uh, he had a certain kind of poise, but he also had a, such c discomfort and, and mm -hmm. clumsiness and such a weird voice as well. It, even the Brooklyn pronunciation, I remember him ruining a couple of pieces that I'd written just because I hadn't anticipated how he I, – I had one scene where he was supposed to come out in the audience with a big tray full of oysters mm -hmm. and be calling, who wants a fresh – oyster, you know, and he comes out in the middle of the piece just going, Ersters, Ersters, who wants Erster? And of course, the audience is just going, what? Why is this guy shouting Erster? And it was like, oh, we should have rehearsed it. And I guess that that could be the, the theme for the whole retrospective. We should have rehearsed, rehearsed it. it. So I think Thomas has found the new Letterman YouTube channel, which is newly minted, correct? Uh, I think it's like two months old. Two months old. So it's called, so how would people find it, Thomas? What's it called? Uh, I believe I just... I just that's Letterman. yeah, yeah. Then, that's it. And then he comes up, and you yes. can find Calvert. He's there, and they and he has trendily using the Ukraine colors before. Ah, <laughs> that is nice. What were you going to ask, Fritz? No, I was just going to say, um, as, as Steve was mentioning to us before we went on, that Letterman does some fairly updated interstitial stuff, commenting on the. Oh yeah, there's some brand new things on this, and again, this is where it might differ from those people that were fans of Don Giller's uh, hodgepodge collections. Um, these are a little more curated, a little more edited, uh, and then there's also commentary by writers uh, who who took part in the show, directors like Biff you? Henderson, like you and the other Steve from Zoom. Uh, 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 Steve is represented with material, but mm -hmm. I don't think he's been interviewed yet. Um, <laughs> we're going in order of seniorness, I guess. I don't know. Um, but Letterman tapes brand new things, too. Like he'll respond to a current event that's in 2022 or he'll 
or he'll offer some strange anecdote out of the blue about the, the day he got knocked unconscious on the streets of Providence, Rhode Island. And you go like, well, this has nothing to do with any of the shows, <laughs> but it's just a funny two minutes long. And and if you're interested in Letterman and his personality, it's very, very fascinating to watch. Him. And a master storyteller. That's what I loved about him. <laughs> when he was a guest with Carson, he, he would spin these tales that were fantastic. Yes. And you understood his talent. We yes. have to talk about Steve Young's yes. movie. It's not his movie, and he wants me to make sure that I say that he's the subject of the movie, and Steve Young, take it from there. But it was his passion. It oh, yes. It was his obsession that turned it into a movie. Oh, yes. So tell us all about it, Steve. Well, uh, what we're talking about is a documentary made by Dave Wisenant called Bathtubs Over Broadway, and it grew out of my work on The Letterman Show. And in fact, Steve O'Donnell was instrumental at the very earliest stage in pointing me in this direction. My very first day of work, 32 years ago this month, Steve brought me down the hall in 30 Rock in the offices and said, well, if you're, uh, if you're going to work here, we're going to find you an office. And luckily, several writers had left recently. There were a few empty ones. He said, how about this one? It was an office where, you know, it had the usual uh, desk and chair and everything, but there were also boxes of record albums. And I said, well, what are the, what, what's the deal with these record albums? And he kindly explained, because my knowledge of the show was actually rather iffy at this point. We do a bit on the show called Dave's Record Collection with unintentionally funny record albums that we hold up and we enjoy bits of. And uh, so the writer who used to have this office was in charge of that piece and gathered up the material. Hey, maybe you can be the new uh, person who will do Dave's Record Collection. And I said, oh, okay, whatever. Cut to, uh, I don't know, 28 years later, and a feature documentary bursts onto the scene, uh, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, won a lot of awards, and it, it's on Netflix and other platforms. It's about the strange records I accidentally began finding when gathering material. I found there was a whole hidden subculture of musical theater written for company conventions and sales meetings that the public was never supposed to know about, and it only leaked out a little bit because sometimes there were souvenir record albums pressed just to give to the salesmen and distributors and so on. And I started finding them at thrift shops and used record stores. And I said, this is the strangest branch of show business I can conceive of. And it's hilarious, but it's done sincerely. Who did this and why and what did they think about it? And that is kind of the kicking off point of the documentary. It's really wonderful. Give him some titles like Dazzle Diesel or Diesel Dazzle. So they're, they're just the titles suggest yeah. everything you need to know. That's right. Uh, Diesel Dazzle, Detroit Diesel Engine, uh, 1966 musical for the uh, diesel engine distributors and salesmen. Uh, got to investigate Silicones. That was a business to business musical General Electric put on to convince other uh, industry representatives that GE Silicones would help their manufacturing. Uh, the bathrooms are coming, of course, uh, landmark achievement in the field. American Standards 1969 bathroom fixture musical put on live in Las Vegas to convince uh, distributors of bathroom fixtures that American Standard had the stuff going into the new sales year. And these were th these were massive productions. You even made a comparison of how much it cost to launch an actual Broadway show. And these shows were like six times as expensive as a regular Broadway show to put on. And they were performed yeah. just a couple of times. And that was the end of it. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, they were usually extremely ephemeral. Sometimes they toured around to a few cities and the, your, your, your American Motors dealers in Chicago would see it. And then it would go to Florida and then it would go to Dallas. Sometimes it's just once in a hotel ballroom at eight in the morning where 250 floor tile salesmen would see a <laughs> show and it might be miserable. Plenty of them were just God awful. A lot of hastily uh, thrown together song parodies, but the top end with money from general electric or GM or Westinghouse or Ford or whatever, just unlimited budgets. I think it was tax deductible, but they just said, who's, who's good. Who's a good Broadway writer these days? Dangle this money in front of them and see if they'll write a musical about selling fluorescent light fixtures or whatever. And, and so you found that there was top talent involved in these productions. And then you, after being an avid fan and collector, got to go out in the making of this documentary and meet some of your heroes and idols and even write with them, correct? 
Yeah, it really took an amazing turn from something that had started as just we have to scramble together enough material about these sad, pathetic, weird records to fill a segment to who did this. And I'm going to start doing detective work and find out, number one, do they have any more records in their closet? Because now I was collecting this stuff for myself. But also, what did it mean to you? How did it work? And, and I was thrilled by the attitude of so many of these writers and performers who are not household names, but they would say things like, we, we were well paid, yes, but we always wanted to do our best work because that's why you got into this line of work. You wanted to make something you were proud of, even if it's about ball bearings. You want to say, I want this audience to leave going, oh my God, who knew that I could have be choked up with emotion over the business that I'm in and the, the products and the company and all that. And, and some spectacular talent. I mean, you had Sheldon Harner, who wrote the lyrics for Fiddler on the Roof that wrote some of these things. You had Martin Short, Cheetah Rivera, Florence Henderson, all these astonishing talents who were very proud to have participated in this because, first of all, Martin Short said he made more money doing that than he never made in his life before. And they were all very proud of it. It was not a, a, not a secret to them. Yeah, Sheldon Harnick, that's another Steve O'Donnell story. <laughs> I had uh, found a copy of a new record from my collection at one point. It was called The Music from Fortify Your Future. A little <laughs> wordplay on Ford and Fortify. And the cover was all these Ford tractors. And it was a musical that had been performed for the Ford tractor sales force about how the great new 1959 tractor line is a salesman's dream, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's all peppy. It's fun. It's surprisingly good. It's like, as Sheldon Harnick told me later, I loved the puzzle of it. Take the least promising material that you could ever think of and actually take it over the top with your craft of music and lyrics. But I knew nothing about Broadway musicals. I just was attracted to this for this conceptual weirdness of it and the fact that so many of the songs were bizarrely catchy and they were not for me. So I knew nothing about the real Broadway world and Steve O'Donnell took this tractor record, flipped it over to the back to look at the credits and his eyes popped open and he, I still hear this in my head, Sheldon Harnick, Jerry <laughs> Bach, do you know who those people are? And I said, no, I have no idea. They wrote Fiddler on the Roof. So I went, oh, my gosh, I guess there's layers to this that I'm going to be slowly discovering. So that was part of it. Yeah. Well, the many layers and you mentioned the emotion and the talent. I, I, it's also moving as you in the course of this documentary search out and find people who did the musicals and were just chorus members or maybe featured players. 30, 40 years ago and have even forgotten that they were in the show and you find them and there's a sort of a flashback of memory or they're delighted that something they thought was a throwaway is being celebrated once again. And also just the kind of detective work, like you were so thrilled about the, uh, the, bath, the bathroom songs and the bathtub songs that when you actually find some of the surviving cast members and two of them had gotten married during the, during the, 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 the rehearsal period and performances of the show, there's just a lot of human stories inside the, 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 the sillier historical documentary story. And I will tell you, I found I found two extremely touching aspects of this that you don't expect. You think it's uh, uh, when you first begin to watch it, it's going to be the Letterman bit expanded into 90 minutes. But I thought the two most touching parts about this were the bond that you had with these people. They were so thankful that somebody gave value to what they had devoted their lives to and many people didn't know they had participated in. And you knew the words to all their songs. And as soon <laughs> as they realized that you weren't there to lampoon them, that you had a real human connection, you really had a great uh, bonding and, and did the eulogy at one's funeral. And it was really very touching. And the second touching thing was, and I wanted to ask you this one question and then I'll be quiet, um, was the timing of the documentary's third act, you retiring from the Letterman show, did you do that timing on purpose or were that just kismet that it happened to happen, that you ended the show when you ended your career at Letterman? It, it turned out that way, not planned, but uh, in early 2014, Deva, the director, said she wanted to start making this documentary. The book that you see in the film had come out a few months before and had gotten some 
excellent coverage and reviews. Uh, I got to be on Fresh Air with Terry Gross, with Sheldon Harnick, who I now oh. understood was an important Broadway legend. <laughs> so we were getting some great uh, attention. And Deva, who I had met when she was an editor at The Letterman Show, she had moved into films and editing and documentaries and different things. So she kind of had a foot in the film world now, and she said she wanted to make this movie because she suspected that there was a lot more to tell. And boy, was she right. So many more people to meet and so many more unfoldings of uh, strangely compelling human dramas and all these big questions. But we were making the movie, she was making the movie, months uh, before Mr. Letterman announced he was going to retire. And as Deva recalls, this her first impression of that news was, oh, no, this isn't good for us. But as it turned out, she's uh, one of these great artists who can adapt on the fly and take something like that and say, you know what, this actually can vault us up to a higher level because there's now this parallel. The industrial show world faded out eventually. Steve Young's Letterman career is ending. We can we can build something there that will really resonate so she she took that surprising news and made something great really made it touching yeah it's it's uh, it's a lot of fun and i i know that you've probably got more fans looking into this art form you know since you created your book the book and the film and you know you must be getting a lot of a lot of people asking you about trades and you know how they can acquire certain pieces of work yeah. Yeah. yeah, records that I used to be able to pick up for $20 now are like $400, uh, which is great because I did put aside a lot of duplicates back in the... Uh, <laughs> the, the, the do they I've still do those, lot. Steve? Do they still yeah. do those musicals? Some. Uh, it never goes away entirely because companies and organizations always need some way to galvanize their people. And if you're sitting together in a theater and you see a, some sort of presentation come on that rocks you back in your seat with music and humor and dazzle and drama it can get people moved and inspired and motivated in a way that i don't know that anything else can that's one of the things i learned during this and you don't get the big book musicals very much anymore they were so expensive to make and so elaborate and you can do a lot with video and things on giant screens now but there are a few companies that still uh, every few years seem to put on something. For some reason, State Farm Insurance will not let it go. God bless them. Uh, <laughs> I, I have uh, bootleg materials that have been handed to me under the table from various people. 2006, 2008, 2011, 2018. Really? And uh, there may not be an end to it. Uh, somebody told me, you know, State Farm's 100th anniversary is 2022. I wouldn't be surprised if they put on a big blowout show of some sort. So have you ever attended a show? I have not. And I, I've watched uh, video footage. Uh, eventually in my detective work, I would find uh, performers and composers who had VHS tapes. And that's an interesting phenomenon because I love listening to the songs but I don't know if as a civilian I could maintain interest for a long day of a show yeah. interspersed with speeches from vice presidents. Oh. I, I think it might be quite a slog for somebody who really just, I just want to hear the fun songs about <laughs> diesel engines. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. Well, I, I was reading reviews of your movie and they were all great, but some really suggested the cultural significance of these types of musicals and variety in their review said these musicals represent <clears throat> pardon me the peak of american capitalism that period of time from the late 50s to the early 80s was the peak of american capitalism and this was like a physical manifestation of that peak yeah i think there was this post-war glow when uh america kind of was on the top of the world certainly economically and the tide was rising for so many parts of the country, obviously, uh, we shouldn't oversimplify and say life was great for everyone. There have always been marginalized people who did not participate in that great era. But yeah, the companies believed that they could afford to care about the people who worked for them. Mm. And in fact, they said, people will want to work here for the long term if we show them that we're a family and, and every year we 
put on something that acknowledges the problems sometimes as well as cheerleading but it will be something that draws us all together we'll have a common purpose and people will believe in us and we will believe in our people and then by the 80s that was falling apart uh many people have told me the uh the consultants came in and the bean counters came in get rid of all this morale boosting stuff doesn't help if it can't be exactly quantified then it's useless we don't care if people like to work at kinney shoes if they want to leave <laughs> fine we'll get somebody else it doesn't matter whether people like the company or their job and then we kind of threw ourselves down a well uh, as a as an economy by yeah. too much yeah. of that wow that's, really interesting. that's so interesting so uh, are you ready steves for a little bit of letterman show trivia uh I'm going to say yes, because what else can I possibly it's, say? <laughs> I will say it is not Don Giller obscure, and you may actually know the answers. Okay? So number question number one, at what temperature did Dave keep the studio during tapings? Do we have a buzzer, or should we make a buzzing in noise? You can, yes, yes just like when the UPS man arrives. Okay. Well, <laughs> well I, I recall that you, could, that you could see your breath uh, during mm -hmm. rehearsals. And I do know there was only one or two occasions when they raised the temperature for shows. And one of them was when Aretha Franklin was on Aww, because she came queen. into the studio and said, I'm not going to sing if it's this cold. There you go. It had to do with her vocal cords. So on that day, the temperature went up. But I would say it'd be around 50 degrees or something, but I don't know for a fact. I well, was going to guess 55, but uh, you were there longer and maybe during the... Well, the there's also a difference. It's 50 degrees when you're loading in the audience. By mm -hmm. the time the taping starts, oh. it might have gone up to 55. Because human, we're, it's a, they're a bunch of filthy animals exuding <laughs> body no, warmth. Right. Continuously exhaling. So uh, uh, according to the internet, the... What's that, Steve? I said, oh, just, you know, a mass of human flesh close to 100 degrees. That's that's that sounds scientifically accurate. But according to the internet, the temperature during studio tapings was fifty eight degrees. Oh, fifty eight. Yeah, but according to the internet, nine eleven was an inside job. No, I, I've been to <laughs> tapings at probably both studios, thanks to Steve O'Donnell, and I just would if you kept your coat on, you were excited to be there, and you didn't. It really you didn't notice it. It was fine. Oh. I didn't have to sing like Aretha, so. You said 50, I said 55, the internet says 58. As Mr. Letterman would say, not a match, the board goes back. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, in the price is right, you did not go above, and so therefore you're the winner of that round, Steve Young. Why did Dave announce that the top 10 list came from the home office in Sioux City, Iowa? He often did it because someone asked him to do it. Either a fan or someone he met at a at a event somewhere. Uh, at, at first, he just made them up, Scottsdale, Arizona, because it sounded like a sort of new business location. There where is a there is a more passive aggressive story. Oh well, I don't know what it is, but can I guess? Uh, yeah, the, the Sioux City uh, affiliate did something like drop yes. the show or yes. or delete yes. it an hour ding, or ding, something ding, like ding, that. Ding 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 ding. Yes. Uh, there is a more passive aggressive subplot. The Sioux City, uh, Iowa affiliate refused to air the show. You understand your Dave, don't you, Steve? Well, I just what, know I, I know him enough it? that if he were when you said passive aggressive right. or whatever, I said on what other topic would it be except about broadcasting and the show and so on. Why why, why did they drop the show? It was I'm sure it was too racy. Well, we uh, we had a lot of. Uh, Iowa jokes and how many Iowans does it? Oh, so they were being passive aggressive. No, right. I'm just kidding. Well, right. would... How many Iowans does it take? <laughs> what? Drop a show from the broadcast. Yeah. Uh, you pro. I think you're both going to get this one correct. What legendary figure occasionally contributed monologue jokes for Letterman? Ding, ding, ding. Yes, Johnny Carson. After he retired, uh, I was running the monologue for the last 11 years of the show, so I would get these jokes. Johnny would call Dave's office and one of his uh, assistants would transcribe them. Then ah, so the he'd Carson do it via the telephone and, and use his actual speaking voice. Yes, ah. I did not get to speak to Mr. Carson, but I received his jokes and it was clear that uh, Dave thought that uh, they were going to go on the show, which was fine because Johnny absolutely knew how to do this. He was not uh, somebody who was blundering around. But when Johnny died, I think it was 2005, uh, it was during one of our dark weeks, 
But uh, word was passed along to me uh, from Dave that uh, when we got back and we're doing our show on Monday when we were back, he wanted the monologue that day to be all jokes that Johnny had sent in. Oh, I remember that. So I pulled uh, I pulled everything out of the files and went back and gathered them up and put them together. That was an easy monologue to put together that day because he wasn't going to cross any of them out. So, uh, <laughs> so he did them, and it was a little odd because there were various topics which were no longer exactly in the news, but they were still playing pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think there was an undercurrent of the audience going, well, this is a bit odd. They did not explain <laughs> right. what these jokes were or why he was doing it until we came back from the first commercial break. And he was oh. at his desk and he said, I would just like to mention something uh, about the, the first part of the show today. All those jokes that you heard me do out there on the stage, those were, were uh, contributed to the show at various points in the last couple of years by our dear friend Johnny Carson and uh, the audience was just oh my god what now a it loving all makes honor sense. they should have they should have recognized the tidy bowl man uh, <laughs> appearing in some of the beautiful <laughs> downtown let, let me ask you a question about Carson was the staff particularly people that had longevity as disappointed when Dave did not get the tonight show as Dave was was there a, a, a common feeling about that I think that we were, but I think Dave's disappointment was profound enough that oh, it would yeah. be, it probably be uh, inaccurate to, to to compare us, ourselves to it. It seemed to me obvious he'd been doing the show every single night. Yeah. Uh, Jay had been a guest host uh, for for the Tonight Show. I just thought like doing a thousand shows outweighed doing twenty five shows, but um, it isn't always just those those. Those standards, I, 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 I think it's been written about enough about how mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. network thought Jay was maybe more network friendly, more executive friendly, more affiliate friendly. But yeah, Sue um, Kitty wasn't going to drop his show. <laughs> there you go. Okay, question or uh, question number four: Where does Letterman rank on TV Guide's list of the top fifty greatest shows of all time? Whose list? It's TV Guide's. Do they still exist? How old is In this? Sioux City, you can find it. Uh, I, I may be mixed. There was the Writers Guild also put out such a list, and I just remember going to the cocktail party. Steve, do you remember there was a shot of you and me and the other Steve? There's another Letterman writer named uh, named Steve Weiner. Uh, but uh, on that list, Letterman was like 98. Oh, uh, well, out of I'm, the hundreds. I think you'll be I pleased with this up. ranking. You cracked the top 80. This you will be pleased. You are number seven. Oh. And I think that I think historically that's accurate. Oh well. It, How many times did Madonna drop the f bomb in her 1994 Letterman appearance? I'm going to say 55. Steve's going to say 50. It probably is something <laughs> like that. Also, do you count during the commercial breaks? Do you go? <laughs> that uh, might be uh, what you're recalling. Because I think I have... we just have to agree that it's a, a fucking large number. <laughs> <laughs> it's 14. Oh, according to my sources, that's like but that's like finding out how many honeymooners episodes there were. Not that many, but you know, f bombs are like seasoning. Too much is is too much. You know, come on, Madonna, pull it pull yeah. it back. And we're notch. all tired of the old. How many jelly beans are in this jar? Win a prize. <laughs> we could just have Americans guess how many f bombs. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be the new euphemistically used. Uh, do we have any more questions for these two? Before? Yes, I, I just somebody. This is this might be too inside baseball. But what was the day like for a writer? What was the schedule? When did you come in? When did you uh, did you do what they do in a newsroom, which was to spritz what the topics were of the day before you went off and wrote your jokes, or did people come in with jokes, or how did it work? I think people had a pretty good uh, notion of it. I mean, there was a lot of newspapers and uh, TVs on, and uh, um, there were there wasn't like an outline that went out. I, off and on, I seem to remember in the in near the end of my tenure there, uh, uh, people would go around with like, "Here's the headlines of the day." But I, I like, how dumb do you have to be to not know mm -hmm. what was going on? Um, I, I think it varied from writer to writer. We had one of the one of the the absolute. Uh, 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 um, you know, yeoman, cornerstone, solid, contributed workers. Jerry Mulligan did monologue fantastically, but he lived in Nutley, New Jersey, and he had to get on a bus and off the bus and leave on a bus. And it, it, we got to have a, a little running joke about Jerry's on the bus, Jerry's on the bus. And it got to be that we used it for guests, too. Like if a guest got bumped, it would be they're on the bus. <laughs> the guest is on the bus. Um, 
and Mulligan would write viewer mail and pre-tapes and so on, but he was just a master at at short uh, monologue. So but his day like might have been different. Where you guys are doing eighteen-hour days for five days? Yeah, sometimes, yes. And as we got up to like anniversary show weeks and stuff, also some some writers had more to do than others, and that would shift from time to time. Also, there'd be things that be written around a table with, you know, uh, uh, eight or nine folks, and then there's things that were written by one person or two people. Um, different combinations. They were, and again, Letterman would come in with premises all the time. Let's throw stuff off a five-story tower, and then we would just start writing things down. So um, uh, d it, there wasn't really a, a, a cookie-cutter day. Uh, I do remember that, um, uh, uh, you know, they, in a sort of Peyton Place sort of way, all the all the romances and boyfriends and girlfriends and stuff on the staff—they were always. Uh, from inside the show. And I always said, that's because we're on a space station. We, <laughs> we never go down to the planet. We're here constantly. These are the only people you see. We're, we're, we're breathing oxygen extracted from our own urine. Wow. That took a turn I was not. <laughs> we all, uh, all get your period on the same cycle. And... Yeah. Yes, like a sorority house in outer space. Hey, that's my pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're already housing. so Steve Young, you made a comment at the beginning of your documentary about after you do what you gentlemen did for 20 years, you are comedically numb. You are, your brain is fried. You don't think in comedic terms anymore. You were talking about how you approached the documentary. Talk about what that's like when you're, when you're doing topical humor for 20 and 25 years, how it changes your perception of reacting to humor. Yeah, I, I call it comedy damage in in bathtubs over Broadway, and it's not even just topical humor. Although I do find that, especially in this Twitter age, anything that happens uh, within seconds, literally hundreds of thousands of people are all writing jokes about it, and many of them are going to be pretty similar jokes. And even if they're pretty great jokes, we're now up to our eyeballs and well past in jokes and <laughs> individual jokes. Even the best of them, they're only going to make me go, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, the laugh reaction has been burned out of me on so many fronts. Not every <laughs> front. Are you the same, I, Steve? I watch things, and I know this is true of other comedy professionals. You hear a joke or you watch a show or whatever, and you nod, and you say, yeah, that's good. But it's not like I don't have the joy anymore of, oh, my God, that that." Steve remembers me laughing uproariously, I hope. Oh, oh, I also remember you wearing leather pants and dancing on the table in the writer's room doing a Jim Morrison impression. I hope that could wrap up the show today. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't, I think that's definitely true about monologue-type jokes, but maybe that's why one increasingly likes absurd things. That's why I have very few things to recommend. Am I uh, out of line if I recommend something specifically to... Uh, Zoom Steve, that is to say, Steve Let's Young. do that part of the show right now. Let's yeah, do well, your recommendations. Steve, you're maybe going to go, oh, I'm very familiar already. A British team, Mitchell and Webb, have you watched them at all? They are I'm, they I'm are sketches know. you would write if you could write them because they're all based on some very small misunderstanding that you can't believe that everyone involved is so dumb that they can't get past it. And they do this about a <laughs> hundred times and they're all fantastic. They're really, really, really good. I for, are they I on think YouTube? so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, they may even have their uh, own uh, network. They're fairly they're fairly or? no, I think they're fairly contemporary. There's other British teams that I like a lot, the, uh, the Harry and Dick. Dave, I might remember Paul and Harry. Anyway, um, I think Harry and Dave are like they send you gift baskets. <laughs> that's right, the uh, the pairs. Uh, no, even I, I mean, I'll go online and listen to Goon Show and Spike Milligan and stuff. But but Mitchell and Webb, I think, are current. But are you looking for something that's just so kind of like? twisted that it's something your no. brain hasn't heard before no no i i might have mentioned key and peel it's like you watch their mm -hmm. sketches nobody's going to duplicate those exactly if there's they're just too rich and too specific mm -hmm. and when you get done watching them and going well not only were the performances great i wouldn't change one line mm -hmm. which you can't always feel watching an snl sketch because well first of all i don't think they took they have as much time to take the care. Mm -hmm. And they're also not aiming for exactly the same thing. There's a sort of higher conceptual level, even though they're very silly uh, and, and funny. Do and either, feel, but I mean, there, there are things that you can look at and admire and laugh at. Since, well, if you guys were to sort of peruse some of Don, Don Giller's channel or, or Letterman's channel and click on something that you know you created, 
are are you sometimes like pleasantly amused that that came out of your mind enough to smile i almost never want to watch any letterman clips i uh, really? maybe maybe another decade or two uh, <laughs> i have a website where where i gather some things i'm proud of and i'm fine with those and i've occasionally had an occasion to look at them again and think oh that's good your but, website uh, is wonderful wonderfully put together oh, it's called I, steve young world if you'd like to visit and we'll have links right. in our show notes very good thank you yes uh, so so i don't really at this point feel excited about revisiting the letterman world uh, uh, maybe i will become more fond of that over time but mm -hmm. uh, Key and Peel, yes, uh, I go on deep dives in that. I am not so comedy damaged that I cannot enjoy, truly enjoy good stuff like that. I've also seen some Amy Schumer stuff recently that I had never seen before that I liked. Uh, but the thing that reliably makes me actually make an audible laughing noise. <laughs> and there aren't many things that do this now, but. Oh, my God, the bad lip reading. One of the few things that I am jealous of that I could not have created. The combination of utter nonsense and utter rigor in how it is constructed to fit the mouth movements of of various people talking. I think this is this is my comedy dreamscape now. It's like, <laughs> like a fever dream where logic has collapsed in on itself and it has the shape of human conversation. <laughs> than well, th th this is wonderful. Now I understand those initials, those uh, acronyms you've been signing off your texts to me with, the ALN, audible uh -huh. laughing noise. <laughs> you, you bypassed the LOL. It just went with the audible laughing noise. All right, Steve Young, it's time to see what's in that box. Oh, okay. Let's see if we can get this now. By the way, I'm going to mention another Letterman writer. That picture of the guy holding the sport coat is from a dry cleaning ad, but I thought it looked very much like Tom Gamble, who wrote the uh, co-wrote the uh, "They Took My Show Away" and several of uh, the uh, film specials. Well, he wrote a million gazillion things. But I love this wallscape of Steve Young. It's really I'm going to freeze frame it so you can see the couch and the artwork. Oh yes, those are from. Oh, this is a big package. Yeah, you can see why I had to run down. Stairs. Yeah, I do. He's I'm happy you caught him or he caught you home. Believe me, I am too. I, I wouldn't want the neighbors to have a look at that. Well, while Steve is opening this up, I will quickly answer the question about do I like looking at old things? Okay. Uh, not really, but there occasionally something will move me because it will remind me of like the, 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 the whole running bit that my mom inspired. Yeah. When I was home once and she had uh, observed that Letterman wasn't wearing the, uh, the gym shoes along with the sport coat and tie and that he was wearing leather shoes, mm -hmm. she said – did his supervisor talk to him? <laughs> and she was, and she was quite serious about that. She didn't. Uh, oh wow, that's, that's oh, nice. oh. Steve a, Young has received ass. a guitar in the mail. Oh, wow, it's a Fender. That's beautiful. And Wait. it's like uh, uh, like sea foam, aquamarine. Can, can we hear the backstory? Because this looks like a vintage purchase. Well, this is an Epiphone Les Paul SL, which is a very cheap low-end guitar but uh i've had it modified uh i do play guitar you may have seen the other one yeah. there mm -hmm. and uh i've recently uh, uh gone electric and uh i wanted uh an inexpensive guitar that was actually pretty cool there's a guy in florida who i bought from before he picked up inexpensive guitars and hot rods them so this one he got nearly new put new pickups in it better tuning machines, better electronics under the hood. And uh, it's not strong, right? It's not, uh, oh, it is. It is strong. Can you play a little it's something? It's not necessarily in tune. Yeah, let's hear if it's Yeah, close. but I had him put on this uh, purple uh, leopard print pick Ooh. Guard. Maybe you could play a little something from The Bathrooms Are Coming. I actually could. I was impressed with how you knew the lyrics to every single one of those songs you launched into there with the people that wrote them and performed them. Yeah, I had a lot of stuff just in my head for sure. And your own song was recently covered by uh, Christian... Oh, Christian Chenoweth. Yes, maybe you'd like to play a little bit of that. 
Oh, that one I'm not up on. But okay, yeah, so I yeah, back- that one with Broadway legend uh, Stephen Schwartz. I am uh, pursuing a songwriting career now, among other things, oddly enough. So I'm all over the map. All right. Well, I'll let you pick out something to play a few, all right. a few bars. I have the perfect song for Okay. You. Steve Young does have an amazing memory. That's why he a, was a, a good match with the Letterman, because Letterman's memory is unbelievable. I, would, I went 25 years or so without seeing him, and then when I called on him like a week or two before the Late Show had its final broadcast, he remembered – sentences from the middle of conversations that we had in his office oh, from, wow. from decades before. I think it's because he cares. Uh, he cares, he's smart, he pays attention, and he remembers. Do you but, think he's happy to not be as active as he was? Because the big legend was, particularly people that knew him, uh, thought he, he was so married to his work that he's, he's going to be a detox period for him. I, I think um, that's a tough one. I think he has, has has wanted to do broadcasting and do shows all his life. And uh, I think there may be some part of him that is glad he doesn't have the particular pressure of a nightly show. But I think he still wishes to have a media presence. Mm-hmm. And it's also something he's good at. Why would you Absolutely. why would you give it up? But on the other hand, uh, if dancers, uh, artists, whatever, there is sometimes a kind of, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a, 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 you reach a sort of golden era. You want to relax a little bit. Uh, he seems definitely seems mellower, and he certainly is. Uh, he seems, uh, you know, less 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 driven. But I mean, just the very fact that he launched this new uh, YouTube channel mm-hmm. just re- recently, a pretty big undertaking, mm-hmm. and that was with a couple of uh, producers from the uh, from the original shows. Barbara Gaines, who you might remember, her mm-hmm. squeaky voice from backstage, and Walter Kim, you might not remember, but a very competent and uh, congenial producer and technician. So uh, Worldwide Pants owns all the clips that he's putting up there? Do you have to get them cleared through CBS? or? Yeah, though the Worldwide Pants didn't exist in the NBC era. I, I, I don't know exactly what the legal part of it is. For a long time, it was tricky showing clips from NBC. We do anniversary shows at CBS, and NBC was not cooperative about putting things up. But occasionally... Sometimes we would just do it just the same, like, like, oh, you're going to claim it's intellectual property, and so do you really want that public battle? Or I don't know. Actually, I should stop talking. I don't. Okay, understand. so Steve, Steve Young, I'd, I'd like to have like a little pre-production meeting with you, if I may. Could Pretty you good. sing like a few bars of lyrics and then just go into some chord changes so I can read the closing credits? Okay, so I'm going to do a little bit of the. Haunting ballad from American Standards. Oh, yes. Musical. <laughs> yes, uh, please. My Bathroom, which you see me uh, do a live performance of in the movie. But uh, in that case, uh, I had the vocals by the original singer, Pat. But here I'll do a little myself. So do you want to have me play and sing and then just play? Yeah, why don't you play and sing about eight bars and then and then play? Oh. And then I'll read the closing credits. My bathroom, my bathroom is a private kind of place, very special kind of place, the only place where I can stay. Making faces at my face. (laughs) (laughs) We would love for you to join us online on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you've been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank our wonderful guests, Steve O'Donnell and Steve Young. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music tonight is by whoever composed my bathroom. <laughs> I am Louise Palanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.
haunting. And yet life affirming. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was, was just awesome. extraordinary. Thank you so much. Congrats on the guitar, Steve. That is yeah. awesome. Are you happy with the sound? Uh, sure. I just uh, barely did anything besides tuning, and I have all sorts of things to experiment with. But yeah, so far, so good. And it jumped right into the pool with me on uh, my bathroom. What better way could there be to christen a guitar? <laughs> <laughs> now, will there be a follow-up to uh, bathtubs, or is there, you know, it had to breathe life into that whole genre of music. Yeah, I don't know if there will be another documentary. I don't know that you could top what we had there, but uh, the book, uh, the rights to it were bought by Steven Spielberg's company, and they've been developing a scripted fictional movie set in the world of industrial shows in the oh, golden that's age brilliant. That's brilliant. and uh, i've done some consulting on the on that project no idea whether it will ever happen but they've gotten pretty far along with it with a, a great director and a great screenwriter and could happen 